All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this event of the Center on Regulation and Markets at Brookings. My name is Sandra Putnak, and I'm the Center Director. We have a great group of experts here today to talk about the proposed updates to OMB circulars A4 and A94. As you might know, those really uh, guide government to benefit cost analysis, and the previous ones are multiple decades old. So new scientific and economic understanding have made it necessary to update them. We have a great discussion moderated today by Senior Fellow Phil Wallach. He's at the American Enterprise Institute, and a great group of panelists, Ted Geyer, the president of the Niskanen Center, Zachary Lisko, he is the chief economist of uh, OMB, Connor Razo, who is the Senior Associate General Counsel at the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, and Richard Reves, the Administrator of OIRA. And we're going to have the discussion centered on the benefits of the new updates, as well as some concerns that people have raised. And so I'm really glad that uh, all of you are here, and I hope you enjoy this uh, great event. Thank you. Phil, over to you. All right, well, uh, thanks so much, Sanjay, and uh, to Brookings and to Niskanen for helping organize this event, and thanks to those of you who are with us in the audience and to those who are joining online uh, now and in the future. So um, let me start with a question for Administrator Revez. So the first day of the Biden administration, we had this uh, memorandum announcing sort of big changes potentially in the way government would handle regulatory process. These new proposals and, uh, and the new executive order are the delivery on that. So what have we got here? Is this an incremental change to the way we do regulation, or is it a big departure? Is it tweaks to the update, tweaks to update the practice of cost-benefit analysis, which was pretty good before? <laughs> or is it a fundamental rethinking, as some people have said, to humanize a discourse that was rotten before? Uh, I think it's neither. Um, like, you know, most things, it's somewhere in the middle. It's, uh, it's not trivial, obviously. But, but keep in mind, this is the most important thing, is that uh, the whole package uh, reaffirms um, the approach in Executive Order 12866 and 13563, which are the uh, Clinton and Obama executive orders that have been around since they were promulgated and have... Um, um, remained in effect across all intervening administrations. Um, so it reaffirms the executive orders. It reaffirms the role of OIRA um, as the institution to perform centralized review of important regulations. Uh, it reaffirms uh, the primacy of cost-benefit analysis as the guiding analytical technique for, um, for determining the impacts of regulations. So that's all... Um, consistent with all prior practice. Um, now, like all other good things, once something is, um, uh, this is less true for, about one's kids, because you know, just because they're 20 years old doesn't mean they're less good than when they were born. But, uh, <laughs> but for documents like Circular A4, um, you know, knowledge advances. Um, market conditions change, the scientific and economic understanding moves forward, and, um, and from time to time, it's time to update a document like that. And so we see this as an update to uh, have it reflect the most recent uh, scientific and economic understanding. I mean, even um, you know, the, the arguments about how, by looking at more seriously the distributional consequences, we're departing from the original understanding of cost benefit analysis, we don't see it that way. I mean, both the Clinton and Obama executive orders talk about distribution, equity, and human dignity. Uh, Circular A4, the um, existing version, which dates back to the Bush administration, also talks about, um, makes space for taking distributional consequences into account. I think the problem there is that agencies in the regulatory process never got around to implementing these things in the way that they were intended. And so we try to give them a push and some tools uh, to do a better job there. Okay. 
Well, let me turn next to Zach Lisko. Um, how should we think of the role of OIRA as changing uh, in, in making these executive order and the, and the proposed changes to A4? Uh, OIRA is obviously an important part of OMB. It's sort of the nerve center for regulation. Um, some people think of it as a gatekeeper. Is, is the gatekeeping role changing? Is it becoming more proactive? What do you think? I, I'm going to pass that to Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I don't think the role of OIRA is changing in any meaningful way. I mean, there are obviously some tweaks. Um, the executive order uh, changes the threshold for regulations that get the full, uh, full-scale RIA treatment uh, from 100 million to 200 million. But you know, the way we look at it, um, 200, the 200 million now are roughly uh, what 100 million were in 1993 when the Clinton executive order was put in place. Actually, it's less than what those would be. And, and actually, this 100 million number dates back to the Reagan administration in 1981. So, um, um, you know, so some adjustments seemed appropriate. Um, one thing that we stress in the, that the president stresses in the executive order is creating a more robust space for public participation, particularly by uh, underserved communities. Um, and again, it's not like it was anyone ever thought, oh, the only people who should be participating in the regulatory process are highly sophisticated trade associations or national groups. And I said, oh, that's like the way we should build the process. But as a practical matter, uh, and for totally understandable reasons, it kind of worked out that way. Right. And so um, we're trying to sort of create a nudge uh, for agencies and also for OIRA itself through 12866 meetings that would um, create more opportunities for that. But again, I, I, I see these changes as very important, but um, happening fully consistently with ORS traditional role, with the traditional role of these executive orders, with the traditional role of cost-benefit analysis. All right, let me try Zach again with a better economist question now. So. Uh, the discount rate changes are one of the big, uh, big ticket items here. Um, I, have to, uh, I have to say it's a little bit, a little bit confusing to follow the particulars f- for somebody on the outside. We have three and seven before, and now we have 1.7. Uh, I know that's that's a little bit of an oversimplification. So, can you walk us through where those changes are coming from, what they mean about uh, how the government agencies uh, weigh the present versus the future? Yeah, sure. So uh, traditionally, there have, with uh, A4, there has have been two options, a 3% rate and 7% rate. With A94, uh, for benefit cost analysis of government spending, uh, which is what I've worked on, there's actually just been one rate, uh, 7%. But that 7% comes from the same source as the 7% in, in A4. Uh, so the thinking here is twofold. Uh, first, with respect to the 7% rate, like Ricky said, we're just paying attention to the most recent you know, economic and scientific understanding. And when we talk to experts, uh, it overwhelmingly seemed like the method for coming up with that 7% uh, was, uh, was not super well-founded anymore. Like, you could not find, actually, in the conversations I had, there were, there were actually literally zero people who, who would defend seven uh, percent, uh, and not that many who would defend uh, the, the the method for it for it either. So that's why we uh, no longer use uh, that method. As for the the three percent, so that three percent was calculated a couple decades ago using a certain method. Uh, when that was done, uh, there was no regular process for updating it for more recent data. The data have changed over the course of a couple decades. Uh, you know as conditions in the world are want to do. When you use that exact same method uh, that was used to calculate 3% a couple decades ago, you now get 1.7%, which is where which is where that comes from. And so tell us a little bit about the implications. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's just a, a variable and a math problem that's changing, but this has a compounding effect, and so it's a, it's a big change. Yeah, so uh, it's a significant effect. You know, the less you discount, the more the future is weighted in the benefit cost analysis. Uh, and uh, you know, th- this has implications for things like you know, climate impacts uh, and the such. Uh, and we are, I guess our view is that 
we're following the best scientific uh, economic evidence, and this is the number that it that it happens to produce, 1.7 percent. And you know, we're, we're going with the consequences, uh, which in this case will mean with the future more. But uh, we're just uh, following the, mo- the following the evidence, which is how we okay. Can, yeah. So let me follow up on that a little more. So when you you you've changed that math problem, but there's also sort of a sense from these new changes that. It's not all about math problems, right? At the end of the day, there are there are some non-quantifiable benefits that, that need to come in. There are maybe some values that we can't monetize easily. So help, help me think through this. You, you have your math problem. Some things about how you do the math has changed, but you've also got these things that don't go into the math problem. How do we reconcile those? Yeah, so I mean, I, the discount rate, I think, falls very squarely into the same method, right. new, new numbers based on changes in the world. You know. Uh, proposing a certain method like distributional weights uh, to take into account distribution uh, is, you know, totally consistent with like normal practice in economics. But of course, there's no like science out there that says like here's the way to do it. We are of course paying attention to all sorts of evidence when suggesting what the weight should be. Uh, based on how individuals behave in the world and what surveys say, people think about how the margin utility of, uh, declines. But of course, uh, distribution is, to a significant extent, uh, a, a, a value judgment. And for that, you know, we're paying attention to practice out there in the world. And economic practice takes into account distribution. Uh, as Ricky has said, the uh, the executive orders on which these are based have pointed to distribution as an important consideration for for decades, and we're just saying, okay, uh, here are suggestions for how one could go about doing it in ways totally consistent with the ways the UK has done it for decades, the way that economic practice uh, looks at these things, you know, the way that these things are taught in, in economics programs around the country and around the world. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me move on to our other panelists, and then we'll, we'll get to a discussion all together. But let me ask Ted a question uh, down there at the end. So, Ted, you, you're someone who I think of as a champion of, of cost-benefit analysis as a, discipline, a disciplining mechanism for agency thinking, um, not necessarily as the last word or the only word in deciding what an agency should do, but uh, a rigorous and comprehensible to, way to explain what it, what it thinks a rule is going to do and why that will be good. So... Um, before this proposed rule was published, uh, plenty of fans of cost-benefit were nervous that the Biden administration's changes would somehow hollow out the practice. Um, now that we have the proposal, what do you think? Tell us your early impressions of what's good, bad, and different in this, in, in this set of changes. Great. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, everyone, for being here. First, just to reiterate what, what Phil said, yeah, that's my view of benefit-cost analysis. To me, it's a disciplining tool. It's a tool of how you make an assessment about a regulation or any policy, trying to strip away your own ideological biases before you come to a decision. Now, it, that doesn't mean it's all calculated benefit and cost or non-quantifiable things or other considerations that go into it. But again, it's a, it's a disciplining tool, and we should keep to the fidelity of the science behind it. Another way I think about it, the same kind of in a different inverted way, is like when I think of changing how we do benefit-cost analysis, I ask myself how would my political and ideological opponents use these changes in ways that I think would move us away from what I think is a fair assessment. So with that as like a basis, I would, I would just reiterate uh, what the administrator said. My assessment, I think his quote was, this is a very important but fully consistent with OIRA's traditional role. That's how I view the changes. I think they, they uh, you know, yet again reaffirm the importance of an analytical approach to benefit cost analysis and regulatory review. I view a lot of the changes in the spirit of that, uh, of updating our understanding of it. Uh, again, they reestablish the primacy of benefit-cost analysis as a, as a tool in the regu- regulatory decision-making. They've, throughout the whole document, updated kind of standard practice based on scientific developments and economic developments over the last 20 years. <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's part of the executive order, the idea of creating a more robust space to have, make sure that you get uh, more inclusive voices into the process is commendable. I don't know how you execute that, but I think as a, as a goal, uh, you know, regulatory capture is real and something we need to worry about, and anything we can do to signal, or I think the word that was used, nudge agencies uh, and OMB to kind of address that or to be kind of aware of that. I think, again, 
creates fidelity of the process and the actual the disciplining tool uh, of uh, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, we've already talked about some of the major changes. I think the the biggest one, I think, from a you know from a reg- regulation point of view, is the discount rate change. It's a substantial reduction. It's a warranted reduction. Uh, given what's happened to uh, not just our economic understanding, but you know, real interest rates in the last 20 years have changed dramatically, and so this has reflected that reduction. Phil asked about the implications, so I would just say uh, I don't know what anybody's view is on climate policy, but if you're ever in a thoughtful debate about climate policy, it almost always devolves or comes down to your consideration of two things: time and space, meaning how much do we weigh the consequences of the future, because that is where the consequences are most heavy. And if you have a high discount rate, they discount back to potentially negligible. So how you consider that is a very fraught, hugely uh, consequential decision. So that decision to lower to 1.9 will have, I think, very large uh, implications there. And space, it's a global pollutant. So how do you weight the benefits of US actions on, on the rest of the world? I've written about this before. I think there's a citation to my article and a footnote, so I appreciate that. I, was, I and my co-author, Kim Biscuzzi, was somewhat critical and skeptical of the Obama administration's justifications they had for the social cost of carbon and u- using a global measure. One of the things we cited was, this doesn't even, isn't consistent with Circle A4. We can't cite that anymore. Uh, they addressed it. Uh, there is a question that isn't in there. Should... Yeah, I think I, can, I don't remember the exact language, but the la- exact language, but the language it uses in the spirit of what we talked about, which is when you're talking about U.S. domestic policy or, or traditionally in benefit cost analysis, you match the benefits to the jurisdiction of the costs. So if you want to use global benefits, the main justification, as we've seen it, is is some sense of reciprocity. We're doing this to lead the world so that they will respond, or they're doing it, and we have an agreement with them. Again, if you want to get specific on it, you should weight those benefits by the level of reciprocity, which is a tough thing to do. But I do think, again, the, the changes on the scope of the analysis and on the uh, discount rate will have the biggest impacts on how we think about climate-related regulation. So overall, I commend them for what they've done. I've got, I'm have got i going to save for later, if Phil gives me a chance. I've got one concern. This is my, this is my uh, opportunity to submit comments orally, perhaps, but uh, uh, but I should write about, but I'll come back to that if I get enough time. Um, just tell us now, Ted. Tell us now. Don't keep us waiting. So my my one concern, and uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because I feel like uh, I and my co-author, Skip, are kind of fighting an uphill battle on this. The change that they made, which I think is almost, I've heard nobody comment on, and the reason you heard nobody comment on it is it's totally consistent with development economics in the last 20 years, but yet as a cause for concern. So if you look at Circle A4, they talk about justifications for regulation. And traditionally, justifications for regulations are market failures. It's things like public goods and externalities, maybe informational lapses or asymmetries. And the development of the literature in economics, and therefore reflected in these changes, is using behavioral biases as a justification for regulation. Again, Kip and I have written critically of this our view is if you move from trying to regulate to help the environment, which are public spillover effects of pollution, for example, to really move it towards helping people not do self-harm. So uh, I think that's a movement in the wrong directions and moves us from our primary goal here. And as I've written and talked about before, uh, or written about with, with Kip, I think we should be super careful before we use purported consumer rationality for a justification for regulation. Again, you go back to what I said in my framing comments, which is I always ask myself, what would my political and ideological opponents do with this change? And to me, it's a little bit fraught and risky if you open up the possibility that you can justify regulation by claiming, and I would say historically over the last decade with very little evidence, that people are not making optimal decisions, that they're causing themselves harm by buying a low energy efficient, cheaper dishwasher instead of a high energy or high energy efficient, more expensive dishwasher. To me, that could just easily reflect different preferences, which are totally reasonable. And it just moves us, I think, in a a precarious direction if we're starting to regulate because the regulator, who I should remind everybody, present company included, they would admit it, are people subject to biases themselves, are purporting that the consumers and firms are somehow acting irrationally. I just think that's we've moved too far in that direction, and I think it's, a, it's a, something we'd be very cautious about. All right, thanks. Uh, I want to give you, our, our guys, a, a chance to, 
to respond to that maybe and then go to Connor after that? Uh, th- those are, uh, those are uh, fair points. Uh, I'll say as an academic, I may have written a paper that is not super different from that. <laughs> um, but I think functionally, like, look, uh, when you look at the regulations that we're going to have uh, going forward, it's still going to be overwhelmingly the market failures uh, that, that we, we all agree we should be con- uh, concerned about. Uh, you know, if there are, I think many, many people think, I think quite reasonably, there are cases where there's very, very strong evidence, like people do not save enough for retirement, and if there can be a regulation that nudges people uh, toward saving with, you know, minimal interventions, perhaps in ways that, you know, would still allow them to choose whether to save or not, rather than mandating it, uh, we want to open the space for regulations to do that in the presence uh, of evidence, and also you know, in the presence of, the, of uh, you know, all the opportunity for participation that, uh, that we're encouraging even more of here. So I think that there's nothing here that would suggest that moving, moving away from externalities as the, as the or market failures is the primary thing. But we just want to create a, a little more space for these other important cases where there's you know, strong evidence. Can I give just a quick, quick response? I, I agree with the case for retirement savings, and I agree that the answer for people not saving optimally are nudges. Uh, but uh, my concern is things like energy efficiency. We've written on this. If you look at energy efficiency regulations, like for different appliances, and if you look at the analysis done by the reg- by the agencies themselves, the benefits are are minimal. The environmental benefits are de minimis, quite honestly, compared to the costs. And the only way it passes a benefit cost analysis is if you say, well, people are just buying the wrong dishwasher. Uh, or the wrong appliance, and they're not making smart decisions. And, and and just on the nudge part, to me, the answer to that is slap a sticker. If you think I'm making a bad mistake, slap a sticker on it somehow. Give me the information, the nudge, to tell me, like, hey, this dishwasher might seem cheaper, but it's going to cost you in the long run. And then I can say, yeah, but I'm moving in a year, or I don't use my dishwasher that much, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so I'm all for nudges. I just think that, the, again, as, as a disciplinary tool, if we're not too careful, and we'll see how these are executed, it could really be used, and I think in a lot of energy efficiency regulations has been used to justify things that are not really good policy. All right. Well, let's leave that there for now. Um, let me turn to Connor. Um, Connor, you've worked on agency rulemakings before down in the, down in the trenches. Can you, uh, can you give us some insights into how high-level documents like Circular A4 or the executive order that, that's just – and promulgated actually get applied to specific rulemaking. So at what stage of the process uh, are political appointees and economists and lawyers taking the instructions that, that come sort of from the central, the central federal government, uh, and, and um, how is this, how's this new set of documents going to change their thinking? Well, thank you, and thank you for, for having me here, uh, Sanjay and, and Phil. And I should just quickly say, I'm uh, here on my own behalf and not speaking for, for anybody at my agency. Um, I, uh, I think the process has probably already begun. Um, I think there are probably briefing memos um, from the, the, the economists and the lawyers who work on this, um, sort of outlining and summarizing uh, how these changes compare with current agency guidance. Um, I think most of the Agencies have their own um, internal guidance, uh, some public, some non-public, about economic analysis. And I'm, I'm sure that um, these, these changes, um, you know, especially with respect to the EO, um, which is, is final, uh, the, of course, the circular um, is, is out for public comment. But with respect to the EO, I'm sure agencies are uh, briefing upward. Um, my overall take, Phil, is that some of these changes uh, are going to have an impact right away. Um, uh, so agencies are very, very, very aware of the OIRA review process, and they're going to have a good sense of, okay, OIRA is not automatically going to review um, rules that are, are uh, between 100 and 200 million. They still may discretionarily, but um, that, a change like that um, would, would um, or, or, or in the circular, assuming it's adopted, the discount rate change. That can be plugged in right away. Um, but um, other changes, uh, and I think Ted alluded to this a little bit, um, are going to take a lot of work. Uh, and I think some of that work is going to be with OIRA. I think some of that work is going to be interagency work. Um, and so I'll just give a couple examples. Um, 
One is increasing engagement of underserved groups. Um, and as others have said, this is a hard thing to do. It's something that's been talked about a long time. I think OIRA took an important step, actually, in issuing contemporaneous guidance with the executive order to agencies. Um, it's about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 pages of question and answers, and it has a lot of detail um, and some ideas about engagement. What do we mean by um, examples of underserved groups? And I think that's, that's helpful because how it will actually play out varies a lot um, between agencies. And so for some agencies, underserved groups look very different, for example, at the SEC, than they might at the housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so IRA has given agencies um, more help, uh, a lot more help than, than just a line in the executive order. Um, but I think agencies are going to have to you know, do their own outreach with their constituencies, um, and uh, they're going to have to develop their own internal guidance. And so it's going to, it's going to take time and, and work. Um, Another example of this I'll quickly highlight, um, and I think this is an underappreciated part of the document, is this is saying agencies start to make use of new technology in the rulemaking process. Um, so new technology to address mass comments, new technology to use um, um, to address uh, technologies like ChatGPT and, and its competitors. Um, and this gives agencies a nudge, as uh, Administrator Rivas said, um, but that agencies are going to um, need to do a whole lot more work internally. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be discussions with the tech folks, the budget folks, um, between agencies um, and with OIRA. Uh, so this gets the process started. Um, the last one I'll, I'll quickly note, um, and this is one where I hope the public comments are helpful on Circular A4, is the distributive impacts. Um, one of my former co-authors in this area said, sort of writing about cost-benefit analysis, writing guidance about cost-benefit analysis is a lot more fun than actually doing cost-benefit analysis in specific rules. And my experience, Phil, from uh, my government work is that doing distributive analysis in a principal way is really hard. Um, it's hard enough to try to measure, much less quantify, much less monetize um, a lot of costs and benefits, especially benefits, but then trying to break them down into um, different subpopulations that we care about is even harder. Um, and so this is a really hard thing to do. Um, and so I hope commenters have some additional suggestions for how the circular can give agencies more, um, more ideas. Um, and again, it's hard because it plays out differently in different agencies, um, but um, that's one where I think the circular builds this out a lot more, but um, I think it's going to take even more agency work with these nudges to um, develop their own internal uh, methodologies and, and um, frameworks for doing this um, more consistently and better. Thanks. Um... Let me let me follow up on that for for anyone who cares to answer. Um, what's the danger if this goes badly? I guess or it's is there is there any sense that if we're doing this distributional analysis badly, we're going to end up with bad rules? Are we going to justify rules that shouldn't have been undertaken in the first place? Um, what, what are the, what are the critics of these changes wor worried about essentially? Well, maybe I could start. I mean, for starters, um, we want to understand how a regulation's costs and benefits get distributed among relevant subpopulations. And this is kind of like independent of what happens after that. Um, I mean, it's, we already do it for, um, for aggregate benefits and costs. And also for aggregate benefits and costs, um, we ask the agency to analyze alternatives. And typically, it'll analyze three alternatives. I mean, a typical case is, you know, the agency goes with the one in the middle, but they also analyze one that's somewhat more stringent and one that's somewhat laxer, and maybe determines that the one in the middle that they want to go with has higher net benefits. And um, Well, it might be the case, you know, and no way, despite the um, commands of prior executive orders, no agency has really seriously looked at the distributional consequence of these alternatives. They just look at these things in the aggregate. And from our perspective, that's a mistake. Um, it could be, for example, that um, uh, there are two alternatives, and one has slightly higher net benefits, um, uh, but confers all those benefits on very wealthy people who, for whom they make less of a difference. And another one has slightly lower net benefits and confers those benefits on very disadvantaged populations. I mean. Figuring this out doesn't actually prescribe an answer, and the answer might depend on the statute. I mean, there may be some statutes that call for 
taking account of impacts on particularly sensitive populations, as sometimes happens in the environmental field. But we want to know. Also, if we knew, for example, that the people who are um, um, facing a lot of this pollution are people who also face all kinds of other forms of pollution, that might spur research into figuring out whether um, there are nonlinearities in the harm functions. That is, if you're exposed to a whole bunch of them, whether the cumulative effects are worse than the sum of the individual effects. And so if we knew that that was going on, we might actually want to learn other things. Um, I think the only, look, I, I, I can't imagine thinking that learning this is detrimental. I mean, I, obviously there's a cost in doing that, and there is kind of a potential delay in rules if this is going to happen. And I think we are not envisioning like an immediate straitjacket so that the day that Circulate 4 gets finalized, agents are going to be doing this across the board all the time in every case. I think they'll have to use their judgment as they already should be using in doing analysis, you know, like for a rule that has tens of billions of dollars of impact, spending a fair amount of time and energy and money on analysis is a good thing. For a rule that has impacts in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably not so much. So there have to be some um, um, sensible approach. Um, you know, I think we do, I mean, I recognize that agencies are not going to be good at doing this from day one. I think OIRA can play a role in, for example, and we have something called the Regulatory Community of Practice in which we bring together regulatory lawyers from around the executive branch. And then we might, for example, identify a good um, a distribution analysis and kind of use that as um, uh, the theme for one of these monthly meetings so that other agencies can see how one agency cope with it. So I think it'll be like a learning process. It's not going to be immediate. Um, but we think this information is is really important. And, um, and again, it's something other administrations um, uh, worried about as well. It's, it's something that standard mainstream practitioners of cost-benefit analysis would say this can be relevant information. I don't think anyone would say, oh, this is like just irrelevant and inconsistent with the methodology, and if you even like think about this stuff, you have destroyed the methodology. This is very much in the mainstream. Uh, how agencies then uh, do these trade-offs is more complicated, and, um, and I don't know how prescriptive it will be. I think it, again, as I said, I think it will depend a lot on individual statutes. Let me add a, a second gloss on that. Uh, so in, uh, outside of the regulatory space, in terms of uh, discretionary grant spending, which is what A94 covers versus A4, which is on regulation, so actually outside of OIRA, we're actually work, agencies are actually working on a couple of pilots now on distributional weights, in particular FEMA and the Army Corps. Uh, and I think that these are, this will be uh, helpful case studies uh, I think it's, it's there. They provide examples where it's kind of really easy to get concrete. So if you look at FEMA, which distributes several billion dollars a year uh, through discretionary grant programs, they're distributing to particular places uh, where it's actually fairly easy to know how rich and poor people are. Uh, and we've seen over the past several years, FEMA is actually much criticized for distributing grants disproportionately to, uh, to well-off places. Uh, and it's actually fairly easy to see how the methods that are currently used would lead to this outcome. When measuring benefits, uh, one of the most important uh, pieces of that uh, is housing prices. And where do housing prices tend to be higher? In wealthy communities. So what this means is that we tend to be sending our FEMA disaster uh, prevention money disproportionately to well-off areas. Now, uh, we think that that's... Uh, unfair. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's a huge leap to say that. Uh, it's unfair uh, to distance sort of disproportionately to well-off areas. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, there are questions of mechanically how to do this, but uh, it is, we will see how, how it, going forward how, how, how to do it. Uh, you know, the cost to doing it wrong would be, you know, you spend the money in the wrong places. You spend the money in the places where you don't improve well-being the most, but we think that the method that we are suggesting, again, just like in the regulatory context, not mandating, just suggesting here's one alternative, here's one way to do it, agencies you know, have, have discretion, 
uh, is one way to do it, to, to you know, spend money the best and do it uh, in a way that that's fair across communities across the country. That's helpful. Can I take a stab at your answer? I, I just wanted to reaffirm most of what, what they both said. Your, I think your question was, what's not to like about more distribution analysis? I see what they've done here. It's what the administrator said. The original A4 has distribution analysis in it. It just is a paragraph as opposed to really like fleshing out how you can go about doing it. And I think so guidance on that I think is really important. Uh, you asked why somebody might not like it. Uh, sometimes the just distributional sometimes triggers people irrationally, perhaps. Uh, and then the bigger question, the bigger concern, which predates these reforms too, is what I think the administrator said, which is like there's a real strong role here for OIRA on sort of both on an educating and disciplinary measure to make sure that distributional analysis are used not selectively, <laughs> right? Like a lot of environmental regulations are uh, progressive in the sense that the people that are most harmed by the pollution tend to be poor communities, and you have distributional weights or equity weights heavier on there. But a lot of the costs also fall on them as well. So so long as it's applied symmetrically, then I think, of course, it's the right thing to do. I'll just say very quickly, as an agency lawyer, um, I do think there's a, uh, a big difference between the agencies who do cost-benefit analysis pursuant to a statute that is yeah. explicitly judicially reviewable, um, like where I used to work at the SEC, um, as opposed to the OIRA review, where courts have generally not um, uh, reviewed the analysis uh, at all, or if they have much less stringently. Um, and so it, you may see the agency lawyer worry about the more we put out there, the more that a uh, litigant who wants to attack this rule can, can critique um, and argue misses the mark. Um, and so the agency may worry, uh, especially if it again, it's subject to judicial review, about um, showing more cards for judicial review. Yeah, let me follow up on that. So litigation and judges' role in the whole regulatory process is sort of hanging over all these proceedings uh, because so much of important regulatory work heads straight into the courts these days. That's sort of what we all expect, and that's what happens. So uh, anyone have any thoughts about how these changes may be designed to help rules withstand judicial scrutiny uh, or whether they might uh, open up new al avenues to legal challenge uh, in the coming years? Well, my view about this is that, I mean, judges do uh, look at the economic justifications of regulations, even uh, ones where um, the analysis is done to um, comply with the requirements of the executive order. I mean, the executive order does say that um, Failure to comply with the executive order is not judicial reviewable. So no one you know, would say, oh, you know, like we're going to try to set your thing aside because you didn't, you know, submit some whatever. But on the other hand, um, typically agencies include in their regulatory materials um, these analyses, and you know, courts uh, sometimes do fairly aggressive, arbitrary and capricious review, and sometimes set aside regulations because the analysis wasn't up to snuff. Um, I mean, I actually don't think, I mean, in fairness, that there is any judicial decision, at least none that I'm aware of, that says, okay, we're going to strike down a regulation because the time series in A4 <laughs> is 20 years old. I mean, you know, arguably that would be a reasonable thing to do. It seems arbitrary to, like, rely on something that's so old. On the other hand, uh, I mean, it would be shocking to me if a court struck down a regulation because we've now updated that time series and are relying on the most recent 30-year period just like they did in 2003. Um, I mean, again, I, I can't predict what every judge in the country would do, but it would strike me as that. That would be, like, really wrong. Um, so my feeling is, you know, we're trying to rely on the best scientific and economic understanding. We're putting this out for robust public comment. We're having... Um, a peer review process where we are it's like an arm's length choice of the peer reviewers. We're hoping the contractor that we've hired to do this arm's length process will pick leading people. And Sounds uh, so reasonable. I don't know how anyone could ever think it was <laughs> capricious. <laughs> That's the hope. <laughs> That's the hope. <laughs> Connor, you have any thoughts? Oh, I would just say, yeah, the financial regulatory context where we don't send our, our rules over to IRA as independent regulatory agencies um, it's a little different in that the court um, explicitly reviews a provision of the statute that requires cost benefit. And there, the DC Circuit especially has um, really jumped in and said, you've overweighted this study, you misread that study. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a, um, 
a little bit more intensive, or it is a more intensive review um, than the more general arbitrary capricious review. Um, and I also do believe that a wire review helps agencies in the court um, by having an independent review. Um, um, so I, I think um, OIRA is doing a, um, a deliberative process, a, a, an inclusive process for socializing these changes that reflect um, developments in the economics literature, um, I think will help agencies. Um, it'll help, um, help give them uh, backing for, for um, the type of cost-benefit analysis that um, I think um, will sort of help do a better job of, of uh, analyzing the rules. So I think this is all to the good um, and... Uh, um, I, in some ways, as an SEC lawyer, I would envy agencies, at least with respect to litigation and cost benefit, because I think they're in a stronger position. Um, soon we're going to turn to questions from the audience, so, so get ready for that. Let, let me ask one more question for anyone who has thoughts uh, before that. Um, so I'm, I'm just a humble political scientist up here with you, lawyers and economists. Uh, one question that's always interested me is whether the process itself matters, or whether all this concern about the process is just because we care about what policy gets chosen in the end. Uh, so, you know, the, the, so a, lot, a lot of what is emphasized in the executive order and the, the, the proposed changes to A4 have to do with making clear who OIRA is meeting with, making it easier for certain groups to, to petition, uh, become involved in the process maybe at an earlier stage. Um, does all that only matter because it's going to cash out in different policies at, at the back end, or does it matter that the process functions uh, just better for, for its own sake? I think the process matters for its own sake, uh, and it might lead to better, dis to better decisions as well. I mean, look, I mean, obviously you want to hear from... Um, a broad uh, set of um, affected people and communities, and if you're not hearing from some important subgroup, uh, you might not um, make decisions that are as good because you might not, for example, know what some of the impacts are, or you might focus too much on the consequences that have been brought to your attention by the groups that happen to participate. Um, I think there's real value in the process. I think there's really real value in having a broader group of Americans feel that the government hears them. And this is kind of an important part of President Biden's general approach to equity and inclusion. It's not just this executive order and, and this guidance document, but a much broader set of things. But I think at the end of the day, it might lead to um, uh, somewhat different policies. But even if it doesn't, at least um, people will feel that the government is hearing their concerns and taking them seriously. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I would just second it. I think they, it matters both for the outcome and also the process in itself matters. The challenges we'll see, I mean, anybody who runs an organization knows this challenge too. I, I've often used the phrase of, uh, in places where I work, where we want our decision-making to be inclusive and efficient, and those two things are frequently in tension. So, again, commendable that, would, that, they've, that they've updated this and they've recognized that you need to have a process that's not just inclusive but transparent, that that matters for the legitimacy of what we're trying to do here will also matter for the substance of what we're trying to do. But as has been sort of a long-recognized challenge with the regulatory process and with the OIRA, they, they've got a heavy workload. And so with the, some of the other changes, think, are trying to ease some space for them to be able to do so. Well, it's definitely uh, the right trade-off, and we'll try to deal with that in the way that maximizes net benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do I have any questions in the in the audience in the room here? Anybody? I got. I got. Okay. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone for you? Please introduce yourself and ask a question. Hi, Vlad Antikorov, Varea Group. Uh, the COVID. The climate resilience adaptation, now the war with Ukraine with the supply chain issues there, reveal the importance of uh, so-called contingent capabilities. So things that the government should invest that are not useful under normal course of business, but they're useful under certain risk scenarios. Uh, and that's why they're very important. Unfortunately, the MPV methodology is not well suited for that kind of analytics because it's all or nothing, now or never, on the base case. 
One of the biggest innovations the last 20 years in project finance has been something called real options analysis, yeah. which has been used by our friends in UK, in Australia, but for some reason, even though it's an American innovation, it was started at MIT by Myers, uh, most of the financial experts, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, have not even heard about this area. And it applies option pricing methods to evaluate contingent capabilities and battering projects, both in terms of resilience, but upside opportunities yeah. as well. So without kind of trying to put you on the spot, have you heard about this? Yeah. Have any of you? Uh, and uh, is there any thought to kind of embed this in some uh, sort of cost-benefit analysis on the government side? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, maybe I can start. I mean, I think probably everyone here has focused on this at some point or other. But I'll tell you, I mean, an anecdote from my prior life, prior meaning before I joined the government, not prior in a more like existential way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I once brought, you know, uh, represented a, a group uh, that, challenge the Interior Department's five-year offshore drilling plan on the grounds that it didn't take into account um, option analysis. Because basically what the Interior Department had done was exactly what you said, is it looked like, you know, the cost-benefit analysis, well, what's the uh, value of the resource now and what is the current estimate of the environmental and other costs? And if the value of the resource was more, then they authorized leases. But there were enormous uncertainties um, um, especially on the environmental side, about what exactly the damage to um, oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico would look like. And so the litigation was designed to force the Interior Department to look at the option value of delay. Because obviously the decision was not binary, do you like drill now or do you never drill? Um, you could also wait and acquire more information and then make a decision in the future. And we actually won in the D.C. Circuit. So it's not just that we brought this litigation. Uh, Judge Garland, now the Attorney General, wrote the opinion for the D.C. Circuit and said, yes, the option of value delay is a real thing. Uh, the Interior Department has to take into account. I mean, that was the, the, the good part. I mean, that was the good news. The bad news it was that he also said that if the economic techniques for valuation aren't sufficiently developed, uh, the Interior Department doesn't need to value something that it doesn't have the analytical capability to value. Uh, in the next five-year report, they devoted um, about 10 pages out of a 100-page document to a qualitative analysis of the option value of delay. They still had not developed the capability to uh, actually quantify it uh, and monetize it. So I, I would say, yes, I think people understand this is a thing. In fact, I mean, at least in that context, is a DC Circuit opinion saying you actually have to do it. Um, you know, we one of the things we are working on that's um, um, related to this is we're working on a project we just launched. It's called Frontiers of Cost-Benefit Analysis, and it's sort of how to basically create conditions for quantifying and monetizing um, um, elements that have been hard to quantify and monetize. And I think this is, this is one of them. So I think that the, the concept is well known and understood, but the problem is... Um, the quantification and monetization techniques haven't been as developed in these contexts as they are in like financial markets, like stock options and things of that sort. Um, <laughs> sure, yeah, uh, 100% agree. <laughs> Nothing more to add. <laughs> yep. uh, I have a question that was submitted online before the event even. Uh, about the peer review that the Circular A4 is going to be put out for. Uh, that seems like an unusual thing for uh, a proposed government document. Can you tell us something about that process and, and what, why it's happening and what you hope for from it? Yeah, you know, I think it's a, a best practice uh, for uh, scientific documents of, of this sort, and we wanted to follow the best practice. There was something called a peer review of Circular A4, uh, but... Um, but basically what happened, and I don't mean this like negatively, um, the government reached out to six people and asked them to be the peer reviewers. And they were distinguished people. But obviously, you know, in this, um, in a society that sometimes kind of lacks as much trust as there might have been, you know, this could be seen as, you know, you call your friends and your friends say nice things about your <laughs> piece of work. 
So we wanted to avoid that because, you know, my goal in this is to come up with a document that is widely understood to be uh, the best one can do in this area. It also would make it more difficult for, if a subsequent administration wanted to change that document, it would make it more difficult to do because it would have the kind of like um, imprimatur of the scientific and economic community. So we decided the kind of the best practice for doing peer reviews of this sort is for the government to hire a contractor. Um, obviously, we wrote some guidelines for the contractor to follow, but the guidelines are basically we want people who are the leading people in these, this field as determined by their academic publications and things of that sort. And then there's kind of a nomination process that goes to the contractor. The contractor uh, makes a selection. And will it be blind in the end? Or uh, like, like their identities will be known or unknown? They'll be known. Okay, they will be known. Yes. Okay. But they won't have been who you, who you would have selected yourself necessarily, right? It's the contractor who's selecting it? Selecting it's the contractor who's selecting it. And is that happening on sort of the same time frame as the notice and comment? Well, it's a little delayed. So the comment period ends 60 days after April 7th, which I think is June 6th. It might be a day off, so I don't want any of you to rely on what I said <laughs> in deciding when you file your comments. But, check the Federal uh, Register. Yeah, check the Federal Register. But it's around the end of the first week of June. Um, we have the same day, April 7th, we called for nominations for peer reviewers, and the period for nominations is now passed. Um, we're now in the period in which the contractor is doing some due diligence around uh, the nominees. So, um, you know, my guess is that we'll probably have a peer review panel s- selected, or the contractor will select one, around the time that the comment period closes. So... You know, the, the peer reviewers, I think, are getting them 30 days to do their peer review, so it's going to be later. Um, not a lot later, but somewhat later. Will their comments be public, too? No. Great. And the public comments will be also public. Well, yes, <laughs> I should <hope. laughs> Uh, question from Sanjay. Great. Well, thanks so much for this great discussion. And thanks again, Ted and the Scanner Center, for co-hosting this with us. Um, I had a couple of questions. One for Ricky. You mentioned the importance or the increasing importance of distributional uh, effects, right, and how, looking at those. Can you talk a bit more how you go about determining how to divide the population in different groups? Because there are a lot of different ways to do it and, and uh, decide how which distributional effects to look at. You can do right. it socioeconomic, you can do it racial, et cetera. So that, that's one, uh, one aspect. The second question goes to Zach, picking up on Ted's point, which is really, really key, I think, that like regulation was originally intended for market failures and is moving now beyond this for the behavioral side. Can you talk a bit more about the rationale, why, why you think uh, uh, we are moving in this direction? And then maybe for the entire panel, I'm curious, in terms of process, um, how has the advent of AI and chat GPT and things like that affected your uh, perception of comments, right? Like a lot of the comments nowadays are submitted actually by bots, uh, of how you take feedback into account and how you develop and implement your guidance. We start with Ricky with the first question on the. Distribution. I mean, I was focused on Zach's question. Just remind you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the distributional effects, like how do you decide uh, yeah, yeah. Which how you pick the groups? Yeah, how you slice yeah. the groups? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. So the current draft, and again, the current draft is a draft, and maybe we'll learn more, you know, from the comments and peer review, uh, gives the agencies a fair amount of discretion on how they would pick the relevant populations. Uh, we do ask that they follow a consistent approach, except where there are reasons not to, so it doesn't look like manipulable. But so for example, I mean, some agencies have statutory requirements to consider uh, impacts on um, affordability, like this issue uh, for the energy department on um, appliance efficiency standards. So that might make, it might make sense for them to look at um, um, uh, income bans, um, which they already do, actually, um, to some extent. Uh, EPA, um, you know, has lots of commands around environmental justice and um, might, you know, define subgroups differently. But um, uh, the, the goal is not to create a straitjacket, but to create some kind of consistent framework that agencies could use and defend. Um, and... Um, and so that will be our guidance, and then agencies will have to take that guidance. They might then write more specific guidance for themselves in the way that Connor suggested. So that's kind of like the 
danger that you get like pendulum swings, right? Like if each agency can decide that, you might have one agency during one administration thinking that these groups should be looked at, and then maybe you have a different administration, different president who kind of like rolls that back or looks at different groups. So is well, there I mean, a way for, to like make it more consistent? Well, I mean, for example, um, President Biden last month issued a very extensive executive order on environmental justice and so presumably an agency in the executive branch uh, is going to follow the commands of that executive order. Um, you know, you're right. I mean, if a different administration said, okay, we actually don't care about this. We're going to repeal that executive order. We only care about, you know, impacts on mining communities, you know, then that would suggest using a different set of uh, subgroups, but it would be you know, consistent with kind of an overarching policy set by the administration. Uh, on uh, behavioral economics and behavioral failures, I think the starting point here is like just how long it's been since these were revised. I mean, it's kind of remarkable that something of this significance has been, in the case of A4, revised in 20 years, in the case of A94, revised in 30 years. There's just been a huge change in, in economics and especially in uh, kind of the application of these uh, behavioral failings to, or application of policy issues to these behavioral failings. It totally makes sense if you're writing, uh, a, writing a circular circa 1992, which is when A94 was written. Like, you don't include this. You don't include behavioral failings. Like, there wasn't the empirical evidence. There wasn't the kind of the theoretical underpinnings. If you're sitting in 2023, uh, and what you care about is efficiency, or what you care about is well-being, it seems uh, negligent to, to not at least have that as a possibility as a motivation for regulation in the face of you know, several decades now of evidence of, of individual failures to optimize, which would lead to the possibility that the government can intervene and increase, uh, increase efficiency. So we regard this as, as maybe one of the strongest examples of just the massive, massive change in the economic and scientific literature, which you know, kind of ineluctably leads to at least to opening the door to, to, to these kinds of interventions. Was there a third question? I forgot. AI. Ah, AI. <laughs> to my left. Do Do you still <laughs> like commenters now that they might be robots? Well, actually, that's one of the things the executive order asks us to look into, and we will. We are in the process of getting a work stream started around, you know, how to deal with this, how to deal with the duplication when AI might be creating a lot of these things. I can't say we really have the answers yet, but, um, but it's definitely something we're focused on. And, and the executive order asks us to um, Could come up with some policy. Yeah, uh, maybe you don't have the answer to this, but the follow-up question I have is, are you looking into how to deal with what might be a tsunami of bot-created comments? Or are you also looking at the possibility of using AI to process comments? Well, there are clearly good uses of AI and maybe not so good uses of AI. The first one, the tsunami of bot comments, is not so good. And, and that definitely happens. I mean, there, I've actually looked in you know, this a little bit. There are some regulations where you know, Barack Obama files 80 comments, you know, Adolf Hitler files a bunch of comments, Elvis, you know, like... Um, it's, it's, um, it's nice of him to be concerned from, from <laughs> beyond. Elvis might be real on that one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's not good, obviously. Um, uh, I mean, look, if, some, if someone, you know, tells Jad GPT, look, you know, I'd like a draft of comments that, um, you know, oppose this rule because it's, you know, whatever... Um, um, you know, bad for uh, the quality of drinking water in my community. And if this thing comes up with something credible and the person looks at it and says, yeah, you know, uh, maybe edits it, maybe doesn't, but takes ownership for it. I mean, I, I, again, we haven't done this work, but I don't think that we would say, oh, that is, like, inappropriate. Um, I think that will be fine. And it might actually be a way in which uh, less sophisticated groups can actually get yeah. their voices heard. Now, having said all that, how, look, I mean, obviously some things are easy. If, like, dead people are filing multiple comments, you know, something's wrong. Uh, but there'll obviously be harder cases and how we distinguish them and how, the extent to which we can use technology to do that. Um, uh, you know, so, for example, like, the, 
you know, duplicate comments, if like someone puts out something and, you know, a million people follow the same comment, that's, you know, one thing. But if there are AI does subtle changes on those that kind of like defeats the duplication software, that's kind of a problem. And there's probably more sophisticated ways of dealing with that. And, yeah. yeah. And my only point is you might be able to use AI as a, as a way to yeah. be able to separate the good from the bad. Right. right. And I think that's yeah. the idea. I don't think we yet forgot how to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're coming to the end of our time here, so let me turn it over to Ted for a, a few last comments. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. This is a great discussion. Thanks to my friend Phil for moderating and for leading us today. And uh, thanks to Sanjay and the whole Brookings team for hosting the event, putting it on. Uh, Sanjay knows this. Uh, I actually started the Center on Regulation of Markets, I don't know, decades ago, so a decade or so ago, so it's just nice to see it thriving under your leadership, and it's, it's good to be back at Brookings and see you and all my friends here. So thanks, everyone, for joining. I think there's some people might be milling around and saying if you want to socialize, there's some drinks in the back. And again, thanks for having the event. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you.